Yeah, the producers say that it is fantastic Friday and that only happens when we have good news from West Indies cricket because they have a slight lead with nine wickets in hand heading into the third day of the pink ball test against Australia. The wind is lead by 35 runs after ending the day on 13 for one in their second innings following a surprise declaration by the Aussies earlier in the day. Gerard Morrisili has the recap of day two. Kevin Sinclair alongside the new partner Kimar Roach walk into the middle intent on adding to the Windies' overnight score of 8 for 266. The debutant was unrattled by the Aussie bowlers taking the role of aggressor in his 31 run partnership with Roach. But Roach's resilient innings would come to an end when a mix up happened between the pair and he was run out with a score of 9 for 297. However, the Guyanese reached a milestone in fine style. Even better this time around. It's a beauty. And not only that, it's 50 on debut for Sinclair. Nathan Lyon got his man the very next ball to dismiss the Windies for 311. The first time in five innings they passed the 300 run mark against Australia. Steve Smith and Usman Kawaja could not have been prepared for what was about to happen. Kimar Roach and Azari Joseph got the ball rolling, taking a wicket each in their first over. The two bowled lethally and Australia soon found themselves reeling at the dinner break at 4 for 24 when Rose delivered a golden duck to Travis Head. 4 for 24 became 5 for 54 when Alzari Joseph repelled Mitchell Marsh's effort. Luckily for the home team, ICC Test Player of the Year Usman Kawaja was still at the crease and was able to reconstruct the innings. Alex Carey took a counter-attacking approach to put some pressure back on the Windies. He was aggressive striking boundary after boundary in his 96 run partnership with Kawaja, bringing up his half century in just 38 deliveries. Chamar Joseph would be the one to end his onslaught, aggression being Kerry's ultimate demise, Australia 6 for 150. The other Joseph, Azari, took Australia to tee at 7 for 161 with the wicket of Mitchell Stark. But Kawaja was still there frustrating the Windies bowlers, his patience rewarded with a half century after the interval. 50 for Usman Kawaja, his 26th in Test cricket. They love him in Queensland, he's keeping the innings together, is Usman. His captain, Pat Cummins, picked up where Kerry left off. There was a sense of a possible declaration when the pair changed gears. Cummins and Kawaja together put on an 81 run partnership for the eighth wicket. And even after the opener departed for a top score of 75, Lovely Cummins pushed on for his first Test 50 in almost Pat six Cummins years. The declaration speculation was indeed and accurate when Cummins said he had enough he after Azari got his fourth wicket, removing Nathan Lyon. Australia declaring on nine for 289, 22 runs behind the visitors. West Indies openers Tejan Aishandapal and Craig Brathwaite had just about 10 overs to survive the day. But taking the same approach as the first innings was their undoing. Shandapal gone after a review for caught behind. Australia clawing their way back into the game. West Indies ending day 2 on the 1 for 13. A lead of 35 runs. A lead of 35 runs heading into the third day of the second and final test against Australia at the Gabba in Brisbane. And Lance and Mariah, what a performance from this inexperienced West Indies side so far. They have played brilliantly. Um, we saw the bowling quality from the first test, but in the first innings, the batting also came to the party. And what we have after two days is an unexpected contest. Yeah, I'm so happy that, you know, the Windies players, of course, despite going to Australia and, you know, being seen as underdogs, being described as on the strengths, be all odds against them. I think, you know, the West Indies players after leaving Australia would have to leave with their heads held high despite the overall results. For me, Ricardo, I expected worse results. I have to say, like as much as I try to be very positive and optimistic where cricket is concerned, especially for me, just all the odds were against the Windy team. I have to say, I'm very, very impressed with the debutants. Of course, Kevin Sinclair, Shamar Joseph, they have really, really stepped up. And for me, they've even, 
they've played cricket like what I would have expected from the senior players. Mm. To be honest, you know, Kevin Sinclair batting at that number and then putting up a respectable 50 to help the total go to 300. It was a 300. 311, yeah. Yes, 311. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, it's as if, you know, these players have understood the ass assignment and they have taken the opportuni opportunity with both hands and I'm very proud of them. Yeah, you know what? And when a team is showing the kind of fight that this young West Indies team is showing, um, you have to look at their team management and so on because it's obvious that coach Andre Coley and the team management is doing a good job keeping them mentally attuned to their jobs because although they lost the first test inside three days, there were aspects of their performance in the first test that belied the fact that the game ended inside three days and in fact it on the result sheet, it looks like an embarrassing loss, but they bowled reasonably well, and it was the batting that failed them. And now they're batting better than they did in the first test, bowling as well as they did in the first test. And uh, this is a very encouraging performance here from this West Indies team. Yeah. yeah, of course, a lot has been made of the declaration from Pat Cummings, 289 for nine. A friend of mine called me this morning and she said, I don't understand why would they declare when they are behind? And I sought to explain a few reasons, I think. One of them being that um, the thinking is that the new ball, the new pink ball at night will move around a lot more and there will be opportunities to get wickets. And I think Pat Cummings was thinking, if you can get two, three wickets before the close of play in the 10 overs, then that will be a significant advantage for the Australians, maybe more of an advantage than getting another 10, 15, even 20 runs to get closer to the 311 made by the West Indies. I must admit um, that I also thought to myself, Lance and Mariah, that the decision was also made because in it is a hint of disrespect. I think so. In it as well, I must admit that, is a suggestion that, listen, we feel that despite the fact that this test match has been so competitive, we are still significantly better than the West Indies team. And I say that meaning if Australia were taking on India, that's not never. a declaration I think they would have made in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think given all the circumstances, it's not a bad one. It, it, it was an aggressive move. Um, and I can't complain about aggressive moves like that in test cricket. Plus, there's rain in the forecast. Um, and so they might have been mindful of that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that it is uncharacteristic of Australia to make a decision like this. That's how they play cricket. They're, yes. they're, they're a bold team. And I take the point that they are confident enough against their opposition to do it. But I, I think they could have made this kind of decision even against a stronger team than the West Indies because that's how they play cricket. I take the point they may not have done it against the India. No. Oh, oh, which is why I referenced yeah, India, yeah, Sir yes, Lance, right. because when you say stronger team, yeah. right, West Indies is at the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, so... Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I was, think it, I, I th almost said Bangladesh, but I'm not yeah. going to do that. Yeah. But there are other teams yeah. that are not significantly stronger than the yeah. West Indies. Yeah. Um, those are the teams I suspect you are talking about. <laughs> but they definitely wouldn't do it against I don't the likes of India they, or South Africa in top doing. form yes, or yeah. England in yeah. top form. I yeah. don't think they would do yeah, it but against those teams. It is not teams. unlike them to make a decision like that as far as... They, as it's not the first time I've seen Australia do this, True. declaring even on a deficit yeah. because based on the state of the game they want to put themselves in a as best a chance to win the game and the fact is that um they they wanted they were expecting that they could have taken maybe two or three wickets yes. before the close of play they only got one so their their experiment was only partially successful yeah well yeah anyway it was a good day for the young West Indies as they scored a crucial win in the Under-19 World Cup at Potchefstroom Stroom in South Africa. The Caribbean side held their nerve to be top of the table England by two wickets in their Group B encounter. 
player of the match, Nathan Edward, took three for 28 to help dismiss the English youth for 192, led by Hasma Sheikh's 54 before scoring an unbeaten 49 he did to get the win this to 198 for eight with nine overs to spare. Skipper Stefan Pascal top scored with 58. And a good win here by the West Indies on the 19s. The England team are actually leaders of Group B, as we said. And uh, I'm continuing to be impressed by this young West Indies team. They have a lot of quality and they're playing with a lot of confidence. And I'm hoping that they'll go far in this tournament. Yeah, and what I liked is it with the bat, there was a combination of players stepping up. We had Stefan Pascal getting 58, Jordan Johnson with 31, Nathan Edward 49 not out. So for me, again, you're seeing intent and, of course, with the batsmen, you feel as if, you know, the runs can come from anywhere. And mm. I like when that happens in a squad where you don't really have to depend on one person to score runs. Mm. So that, for me, was a really positive sign. Yeah. I know, Ricardo, you had some reservations with how they were dismissed. Was it yeah, that? of course, uh, this team has been bowling well. The team has been fielding well, ground fielding, and they have been catching well as well. I still That's a brilliant catch. One of quite a few in this innings. I still have my concerns though about the, how they approach um, a number of these uh, run chases. Um, I have my concerns about the fact that batsmen keep getting starts and not pushing on. With um, good reason, yeah. And, and I, getting out mm -hmm. softly, yes. Lance and yeah. Mariah, soft dismissals. Um, so that is disappointing for me. Um, and I just feel that when you play the likes of Australia and New Zealand, who have so far been excellent at this tournament, um, you can't be giving away your wickets like that. You can't um, always depend on your number six, seven, yeah. eight, nine, and ten batsmen to get the job done for you. But you are right, Lance. This is a high-quality team yes. with a lot of talent. I just feel that they can be a lot more pragmatic, especially when it comes on to the batting in how they approach their innings. I, and I don't think we could disagree with the point, Ricardo, because uh, a lot of the dismissals, especially from the top-order batsmen, have been soft dismissals. And uh, the victories that they have had so far... And even the defeat that they suffered against the host South Africa, uh, the top performers with the bat were middle and low order bat batters. So the top order batsmen, say from the captain Pascal, who got a half century today, haven't really delivered in the way that we expect them to. Yeah. But you know what? I like to look at the other side of the coin and suggest <laughs> that uh, it is to come. Yeah. <laughs> they haven't and done it yet, yeah. but, but the, the business end of the tournament is still to come. So I'm expecting the top order batsmen um, to come good when they need to. But I, I like the confidence that they are playing with. And I know some of the dismissals have been soft, but some of the dismissals have been soft because they are playing with so much confidence. But you are right, Ricardo. <laughs> they, 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 they There's a thin line, Lance, yeah. but I get what you're saying. Yeah. There's a thin line yeah, between recklessness and, yes. and, and, and confidence. confidence. And yes. one of these things I don't want them to get any habit of doing is what our senior players would have done previously. Mm -hmm. Like you play as if you're playing T20 cricket or 50 over cricket. Yeah. And I'm saying T20 because I don't want to even push it to 50 over. Well, they bat like they're playing T20 and cricket. I don't That's want part that. of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. In, in my estimation, at least. Yeah. Um, but let me say, Lance Mariah, today was a massive victory. We can't yes. underestimate um, how massive it was to beat an informed England team yes. in the way that they did. As I said, the bowling performance was high quality. The fielding was exceptional, mm -hmm. and you have to give them credit. I also want to point out quickly in terms of the change in format for this tournament because we're accustomed to four groups, top yeah. two advancing to the quarterfinals, yes. and then you get knockout quarterfinal, semifinal matches into the final. This time, top three teams advance. You have a super six phase, um, two groups of six. You carry forward the points for the teams who advance from the um, first round of the competition. So you have two groups of six and the top two from each of those groups advance to the semi-finals of the competition. So the West Indies are through to the Super 6 phase and they will carry forward two points to that stage as well, like England will and uh, quite likely like South Africa will. Um, and we are, of course, presuming that they will beat Scotland in the final group game. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to say before we close the segment, that I quite like the fact that some of the top performers in this West Indies on the 19 team, as we have been seeing in recent cycles, are from the Eastern Caribbean. Um, young Nathan Edward is from St. Martin. This is his second consecutive on the 19 World Cup 
the first player from St. Martin to go to two World Cups in the under-19s, of course, Casey Carty, who helped the West Indies win in 2016, was the first. And, um, you know, really, Joel Andrew from Antigua and Barbuda has been the star performer so far. So I quite like the, the fact that a lot of the top performers in this uh, setup are from the Eastern Caribbean and not from the traditional TNT, Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana, and so on. So I, I like the fact that there is this spread that we are seeing now among our young, talented teenagers in the Caribbean uh, with players coming from the Windwards mm -hmm. and Leeward Islands. We go to break. We'll be back with more on the Sportsmat Zone after this.